Welcome to Watch Symposium. I'm Austin, and this is part two of Simon's Collection Review. And if you haven't seen part one, link in the description. And, and if you want to see the man himself, Simon, link in the description to a video we shot together here when he was in Tokyo doing a little bit of watch shopping. All right, so in this video, we're going to look at his 17 Rolex watches. And five of them are his wife's Rolex watches. We're going to start there and make our way to... Uh, the good stuff, the men's models. All right, so number 13 to 17 are his wife's watches. Let's start with number 17, work our way back to number 13. Number 17, Rolex OP blue dial manual 34 millimeter with an original bracelet. It's a 1960s piece and he paid $2,000 for it. Number 16, Rolex Super Air King 34 millimeter 1960s piece. It's got an original bracelet, paid 2,000 USD for it. Number 15, Rolex OP Automatic 34mm with a Rivet Oyster Bracelet. It's a 1969 piece, 2300 USD. Number 14, Rolex 1955 Solid Rose Gold Manual Wine 32mm Rolex. Paid 1400 Last, number 13, Rolex Lady Oyster Perpetual 34mm White Gold Bezel Diamond Dial he bought it new from a Hong Kong AD last year as a gift for his wife, and he paid list price. All right, so five watches. Now, four of these five watches are 34-millimeter watches, and that's a great gift-giving strategy because I could totally wear a 34-millimeter watch, and so if you can get a little wrist time out of your wife's watches, hey, that's, uh, that's a good strategy, all right? Now, he could with the Super Air King, that's a 34 millimeter watch. And I think with the Rolex OP Automatic 34 millimeter, yeah, so at least a couple of these, he could wear himself if he wanted to. And uh, probably, you know, we wouldn't want to go with the 32 millimeter. And the brand new 34 millimeter with the diamond dial is probably going to look too effeminate. But uh, that probably had to be purchased because four of these watches are kind of older pre-owned pieces and you don't want the wife saying, you know, why do you give me all the uh, pre-owned watches? Uh, oh, I want a new watch. Uh, so that perhaps was a, a good purchase there. He bought it in Hong Kong and perhaps he bought it on a trip. But here's a little bit of advice. If you are going to spend money at an authorized dealer, especially if you're going to buy something that's not one of the more desirable models, something like a, a a woman's piece or a two-tone date just buy from an AD close to you but out of the big city. Why? Because a lot of people spend money on these watches to get their foot in the door for the professional steel models and if you buy a watch on a trip you're not going to be able to go back to that AD and press them for that steel Daytona and so you want to be able to go back and um, you know, play the play the former customer card, get your foot in the door. Now, as far as buying in a big city, Tokyo, New York, London, Bangkok, um, go outside because there's a lot of competition. I mean, in a big city, a 34 millimeter diamond dial oyster perpetual for your wife is not going to get you uh, closer to a Daytona. There. Are there are men and women that spend three times that in a day there. They're going to be uh, the VIPs there. So if you go outside the big cities, um, you're a bigger fish in a smaller pond, so to speak. And, uh, and I think your money and uh, your customership will go a little further there. And I have a friend who bought one two-tone date just outside of Tokyo. Quite, quite a ways from Tokyo, but, you know, hour by train, and it got his foot in the door. That same piece in Genza, nah, wouldn't have gotten him closer. So that's uh, some ad buying advice for going to the ADs. All right, let's get, in, get on to uh, Simon's collection. All right, so number one, Explore 39 millimeter. This is a Mark II, all right? So it's not like the Mark I. The Mark I has the solid white gold 369, uh, indices on the dial, whereas the Mark II, they filled in 
those indices with loom. Also, the Mark I has the shorter minute hand, the Mark II has the longer minute hand, and I prefer the Mark II. I think they're both great watches, but I think the Mark II is more on point aesthetically. But a lot of people think that the Mark I will become collectible in the future. Uh, both great watches, but I think the Mark II is uh, what I would go for. He writes, bought new from an AD in Suffrages, London. He paid list price, is my trekking watch, and was my first modern Rolex. I am fascinated with Mount Everest and visit Nepal, Tibet regularly for trekking. And this was the watch he was wearing when he was here in Tokyo. I held it in my hand. I love a well-worn watch. You could just look at it and see Simon's history on it. So much more interesting than a safe queen. It was a beautiful watch. It looked great on him, and it's great that he still has it. Number two, Explorer 2 Polar Full Set. I call my skiing watch, purchased with you in Tokyo. And this is a 42 millimeter Polar Explorer 216570. And I prefer the 40 millimeter Explorer 2, but he was pretty adamant that he wanted the 42 millimeter Explorer 2. I think he likes the, the bigger case and the legibility of the dial was an issue. And you know, the modern Rolex is with the maxi dial, maxi hands. You know, it's good for um, aging eyes, to be honest. So, uh, great watch, got it box papers, and uh, and he took it skiing the next day. So, uh, he took his Polar in the snow. Number three, Submariner Date Ceramic, 2019 piece, new full set with stickers. It was flipped to him and he paid 8,200 USD. That's a great price. He says, I grew up watching Jacques Cousteau, so there is my justification for this purchase. And um, look, I can see why he went this route because of the maxi case, maxi hands, maxi dial, legibility. Internals are gonna be top notch. Of course, if you wanna go more, what I think is the, the, the traditional purist Submariner ar archetype, I would go with uh, not the date, but the no date and not the ceramic, but the pre-ceramic, but it's a great piece. Number four, GMT Pepsi 1996. Uh, comes with a, came with a box, polished, bought from a vintage dealer recently for 7,000 USD. There is a romance about this watch with its connection to Pan Am. I love travel. And, um, you know, if you are a purist, I think having the straight GMT as opposed to the GMT Master II makes sense. I prefer the uh, GMT Master II because of the functionality of it, the way you can separate the 24-hour hand and the local hour hand. And I don't think you make any sort of significant trade on aesthetics, not like you do with a ceramic sub versus a pre-ceramic sub. So that's probably the route I would have gone. Um, but you know, GM, a straight GMT is a great watch. This is probably a 16700. And uh, yeah, 1996. So that would be a T serial, Halloween link bracelet, holes, and uh, tritium, tritium on that watch. So don't have it serviced at Rolex. Find a good independent to do that. That's a great price by Japanese standards, 7,000 USD. All right. Even just. Uh, watch only. They are thousands more here. So it's a good buy, Simon. Number five, GMT Ceramic Pepsi 2019 bought from Burlington Arcade London, full set, new with stickers. He paid a premium for it, 17500 USD. This is my posh travel watch for business trips. And I remember when he was here in Tokyo, he had bought, bought the watch, but it hadn't come into his possession yet. Somebody was bringing it on a plane to him and even at this premium it's still kind of a good deal i mean look there's nothing like the deal you get paying retail at an ad but as far as paying the premium um, for a stickered piece i mean this is a brand new stickered piece we're talking about seventeen thousand five hundred is fantastic price and check it out it looks to be the mark one bezel insert which is cool right um they changed it right and it became blue but the 
what's supposed to be the blue on the Mark I is more of a purple, sort of lavender color. And, you know, it's beautiful. Some people think it will become collectible. I like it because, you know, Rolex is such a perfect company, but uh, it's a failure on their part. Not a big one, just kind of a funny one. Just enjoy a little bit of schadenfreude, um, you know, from a from an otherwise perfect company. And uh, yeah, try and get a brand new stickered Mark I bezel inserted GMT Master II ceramic Pepsi for 17,500 now. I don't think you could do it. So in the end, it's uh, actually makes sense, okay? Uh, so number six, James Cameron Deep Sea from the same shop, full set. I love the dial and hugeness of it. Also have a fascination with the Titanic, 12,000 USD. And look, if you love your big watches, that's the biggest Rolex makes. And I think it's, you know, with that gradient dial, a lot better than just the, the black dialed version. And Paul Thorpe certainly thinks so. And they will eventually discontinue that watch, I think. And when they do, it'll sort of go down in history as a, uh, a classic, the biggest Rolex that was ever made, and you'll see it jump in price thousands overnight. So I think that's a great watch to have. Even if you don't like having it, I think that's one of those watches. If you set it in your safe for long enough, you're gonna be good. Number seven, bluesy, two-tone from 2006. So this is a pre-ceramic bluesy. I am normally not attracted to two-tone. However, this is one uh, this one is so electric with the blue dial and, and had to have it, even though it's a bit, a bit kitsch, he writes. And he paid 7,000 USD for it. That's a great price. Even with no box, no papers, that's a great price. 2006, so this would be either a D or a Z serial. And look, when it comes to the bluesy, you know, I'm not much for two tones either, but the bluesy sub and the GMT root beer are two amazing, you know, five digit two tone watches. I love them. And, uh, and I think the bluesy with that beautiful blue dial, it just pops so much, is just a degree more beautiful than the GMT root beer. And, uh, and so this would be a non holes case. And I would guess that a non-engraved rehaut. That's about the time that they started that, but I, I, let me know about that, Simon. Is it a non-engraved rehaut? I think they might have started it around that year, so it, it may or may not have the engraved rehaut. And uh, the beautiful thing about the pre-ceramic bluesy is the sunburst of not just the dial, right? The ceramic has that, but the insert. And that's something that Rolex just couldn't, didn't, achieve with the ceramic bluesy. Perhaps the future ceramic bluesy, they'll be able to uh, make that into a sunburst insert. You know, I don't know if that's something they want to do or could do or should do, but uh, that's why I much more prefer the pre-ceramic bluesy. I think it's a beautiful watch and, you know, is is the two-tone to have, I think, in my opinion. So that's a great watch and, and a really good price for it. You paid a lot less than you would here in Japan. Number eight, Milgauss Z Blue. It's got a blue dial, new with stickers, 7,000 USD. Great prices on all these. He's doing a lot of good buying here, okay? My punk or left field watch with tinted blue, well, it's got green, right? Green sapphire, which can look foggy or blurred at times and sharp at other times. Now, I like Milgauss's. The one I like is the blue, no, not the blue, the white dial, non-GV glass with the orange indices and I think that's beautiful I think it's a little bit underappreciated definitely a little bit funky and I think it could become collectible in the future and you know as far as the modern Milgausses go I think the Z blue is much better than the black dial which bothers me I don't like the three six nine indices in the different different colors I, I hate when Rolex does that they do it on some of their 36 millimeter OPs, the blue dial and red grape dial. Don't know why they do it. But the one thing I don't like about uh, the modern Milgausses are 
is the sapphire crystal. I'm just not a fan of the the green and it sort of just gets on my tits. Because I think that's a beautiful blue dial and I think it would pop all the more if it wasn't for the green glass. You still can enjoy it when you look at it face on, you can see the beautiful blue, but I just would love to see it without just a clear uh, sapphire crystal. And it definitely, it, it's so Milgauss and it, you can spot it across the room and some people like it and it's, uh, you know, Rolex is very, very uh, proud of, of the technology that they put into making that green sapphire crystal. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, that's probably why I'm, I gravitate towards the white dial, but it's a beautiful watch. And this was one of them that he was thinking about getting when he was in Tokyo. We set off to buy a watch. He didn't know what he was going to get, but he was going to get something. And, uh, on his list was, uh, potentially a Milgauss and throughout the day he'd settled on the Explore too. So, all right, number nine. Tudor Oyster Date Big Block Chronograph Panda 40 millimeter. This is a 90, 1990s watch, paid 6,000 USD for it. I love the design reminiscent of the Paul Newman Daytona and of the same watch genre, waiting to take delivery. And I think since he sent me this email, he's taken delivery of it. And it is a uh, beautiful watch. We might come back and talk about this in a minute. Uh, number 10, Day Date 36 millimeter solid yellow gold. 7,000 USD. Again, that's a really good price for that. Corny, but iconic. I used to work for a company building golf courses designed by legend golfer Jack Nicholas, who I met. He also, sorry, he always wore one. Great memories uh, for me. Yes, he did. He wore one for decades, almost 50 years, I want to say. And he decided to put it up for auction for charity. I don't know if it's sold or it's going to sell, but uh, you know, he's a great representative of that watch, but you're right, it is corny and it attracts an unsavory demographic. And so it's sort of poisoned by many of its wearers, unfortunately, uh, but that's a great price. And, you know, I would probably go white gold, but again, if you're going white gold, why not go steel? And of course the answer is because you can't get the date, uh, sorry, the day in uh, non-precious metal pieces, and I think that's just ridiculous, but uh, uh, I've ranted on about that before, so you know how I feel. Us steel-loving watch enthusiasts do need to know the day of the week sometimes, Rolex. So, all right, uh, number 11, Rolex 1956 OP Bubbleback 35 millimeter solid rose gold manual dress watch bought from a posh dealer in Knightsbridge, London for $2,200. And that's a very pretty watch and it's a great dress watch, perfect for a suit, gold, uh, very classy. It's got the sub dial and uh, yeah, it's great having a bubble back. And you know, have to, you have to watch uh, servicing that and you have to find a good independent and parts could be an issue. And you know, when you buy these 1950s and 1960s pieces, uh, you know, you gotta rem you gotta wonder if it is 100% original, and there's a lot of trust involved there. Um, not trying to plant seeds of doubt, but I'm just saying, you know, it's it's quite an old watch, and so if it does have all the original parts, that's great. But you know, it comes to a point where you just you can't get the parts, and and you just have to do what you can to keep a watch running. And if that means making parts for it or letting the watch die, you. you make the parts for it, but uh, you'll have to find a good independent for this watch uh, and, and many of your uh, you know, 60s and 50s Rolexes. Uh, Rolex, I don't think, would service them, and if they did, well, you probably wouldn't want them to. All right, and we get to our last piece, number 12, uh, Rolex 1959 Solid Gold OP Explore Dial, 34 millimeter manual wind, also from Knightsbridge, dealer 2500 USD and you can see his cute little daughter there in the picture and he can do a 34 millimeter watch after all so uh, he can get after his wife's watches uh, when she's not around if he wants to and this is a you know it's a it's a, a, a cool watch right it's a cool watch and uh, you know again I I sometimes think about getting 
one of these sort of vintage watches, you know, six six nine four or something like that. Just uh, you know, because it's manual wine, you get to wind it every day. And uh, in, in the end, um, what always makes me rethink it is is the difficulty I may encounter servicing them. So, uh, but if you have a good independent watchmaker that uh, has access to parts, older parts, or even can make parts, then um, it makes that proposition uh, all that much more reasonable. So uh, I don't know if I'll ever go that route. Probably not. You know, more of a sports watch guy anyway. If you can't, if you can't take your watch in water, not so interested in it. Uh, all right. Well, that's a, a beautiful collection. And what can we say about it? All right. Well, let's uh, get on to his question here. What Rolex should I add next? All right. Before I answer that question, let's just step back and say that, look, there are two collecting philosophies. All right. One of them is the more, the better. All right. The more, the better. And the bigger the collection, the more pieces you have, the more impressive it is. Contrasting that is the philosophy of less is more. And you know which uh, philosophy I adhere to, and, uh, and that's less is more. Because I think at heart, I'm a one watch guy, and I set out to be a one watch guy without one 4060, uh, no date sub. I couldn't make it happen. I got greedy. I got greedy. That's what happened. And now I have these watches, and I can't sell them because I love them. And if I sell them, I probably won't be able to ever afford them again because some of these pieces have gone up. Um, but I love having one watch and the idea of uh, one man with one watch. And it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, a man who has a wife, a soulmate that he's found, and he just adores her. He loves her. He's found what many of us are looking for. And let's just face the facts. Most of us will never find. And the contrast of that is the guy who has the harem and you know you look at that guy and you think oh man he's living the life that must be great but that's empty that's empty and that guy would kill to have what that man with a soulmate has and that's what the one watch guy is that's that's who he is and <clears throat> when you found a watch that you love so much and and it can share your experiences and live your life with you um that's amazing it becomes your watch and it sort of defines you and all of your experiences are experienced with that watch on your wrist and 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 when you spread that over a big collection it it dilutes that and so i'm a i'm a less is more kind of guy so i'm only saying that to uh make you ask the question of whether you actually even need more rolexes or not okay and if you want to practice the other philosophy of of uh, more is better, then, you know, I'm not saying any one philosophy is better. Uh, I think the one watch ideal is, uh, there. it's based in romance. It's, it's a romantic uh, concept. Whereas the, you know, the more is better is uh, a little bit more materialistic. It's, um, you know, I, it is what it is, but, um, yeah, I would question whether you need more Rolexes. I mean, you've got a diver. You've got two divers. You've got two GMTs. You've got three GMTs. You've got the Explorer 2. You've got your dress watches. You've got your your blingy bluesy. You've got your blingy 36 millimeter day date. You've got your anti-magnetic watch. Um, you've got everything, all right? The one thing you don't have is a Rolex Daytona. And that brings me to the Tudor, okay? And the Tudor's a great watch, but a Tudor, like I said, it just doesn't have the cachet, the punch of a Rolex. So instead of buying that, I probably would have bought a Daytona. Now, would I pay the premium for a ceramic Daytona? No. Okay, I wouldn't pay the premium to join a bunch of wankers in wearing uh, the the ceramic Daytona. Okay, And so that's what makes me think that a pre-ceramic Daytona would be the way to go, all right? So you can keep your tutor if you want or sell the tutor, use that money, but I, I would have put that money into a Daytona. All right, now let me also step back and just say, Simon appears to have a lot of capital to work with. And a lot of the times our 
watch purchases are constrained by our budgets, okay? Now, when they're not, that's when interesting things can happen because people can grow their collection wide. They can just get more and more pieces. I mean, really adhere to that more. More is better. The more the better philosophy. And in that regard, I could, you know, mind, mindlessly say that Simon should get, uh, you know, fill in all the gaps to make his collection look more like what you'd see in a well-stocked AD, a sky dweller, um, a uh, sea dweller, ceramic 43 millimeter sea dweller, uh, a BLNR, you know, that's uh, not the route I would go. Again, less is more, all right? But some people want to do that. They just, you know, the, the, the more the better, okay? But the man with means, he can take a different path. He can stop going for quantity, but for quality. Now, don't get me wrong, all of these pieces you have, Simon, are quality pieces, all right? But they are run-of-the-mill pieces, right? You've got a 1996 GMT, straight GMT, with uh, box, no papers. You got a great price for it, okay? Um, but it's a run-of-the-mill GMT. You've got a run-of-the-mill Milgauss, a run-of-the-mill day date, okay? And if you just want to experience the models, then that makes perfect sense. But if you want to have really punchy pieces, you want to go for pieces that um, are special. Mistakes on the dial, rail dials, stick dials, um, frog foot coronets, those are the pieces that separate, you know, a regular 16710 GMT uh, from something really special, you know, whether it's got the 3186 movement stick dial, all right? So a man with means could search out those watches. He'll have to pay more for them, but he's not going to have run-of-the-mill pieces. And so going forward, if you do add pieces, I would go for unique, special pieces, idiosyncratic pieces. You know, could you go for a pre-ceramic Daytona? Sure, but if you find a Patrizzi dial pre-ceramic Daytona, that's going to be all the more punchy, right? And you're going to pay more for it, but it's worth it. If you have the money, it's worth it. And so that's the route I would go. Now, if you have even more money than that, then you could go with pieces um, that uh, have provenance, you know, famous people. And that's what, you know, it's almost a, 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 a sort of a hierarchy. You know, you go for, you know, the Rolexes you could afford. And if you got enough money, you go for the Rolexes you want, you know, and a lot of them. And if you have even more money than that, you go for the real unique and special pieces. And if you have even more money than that, you go for the actual pieces with provenance that people have. And you pay millions of dollars for some of these pieces. And I'm not suggesting you go that route, but, um, you know, it's just an option. But anyway, I would consider if you want to do more pieces and get more pieces, um, then go for special pieces. And of course, you could always... Uh, go for vintage pieces. Now, you had mentioned the 1655 Explorer 2 was on your radar. Now, you can kill two birds with one stone here because you can develop your interest and your education and that culminate in an awesome watch purchase. Now, you're not going to want to come to Japan and just shell out the money at one of these shops because you don't know what you're getting. You can't. Look, half the time, I don't even think they know what they're selling, you know? And so, you have to do your due diligence. And if it's a neo-vintage piece, it's not that big of a deal. But if it's something like a 1655 or a 1675 GMT, you know, you really need to know what you're looking at. And so I would suggest that you get into the education of Rolex and um, pick up some books, you know, some Mondani books from Italy. If you're looking for the 1655, pick up some books, study it. It's really interesting and... Um, and it'll be a labor of love, let me tell you. And for that to culminate in a purchase, that could be pretty cool. And it could get you into some really nice vintage pieces. And let me tell you, I mean, there's nothing like walking into a shop and and knowing exactly what you're looking at. You know, uh, it it's it's like going to an art exhibition and not knowing anything about art. It's, you can sort of appreciate it and, and, and you know what you like and you know what you don't like, but, but if you know 
the history behind things and you know what you're looking at and and you know it's just a richer experience and so that's what i think i would do if if i were you and i wanted to add more pieces unique special pieces and um work on the education that's going to allow you to make that happen and make you uh safer in in buying because it's a minefield out there and you really have to know what's uh uh, what's up and that really oftentimes is a matter of checking little things on the watch to make sure everything checks out and looking for tells looking for things that are off and looking for that piece where everything just fits perfectly like a puzzle and you just get that rush and buzz because you know you you know you're looking at something really special so uh, I think that's the route you should go but as far as you know more um, run-of-the-mill uh, Rolex watches. I mean, I think you've got a beautiful collection. I just, uh, you know, I, I don't think it really needs anything. Um, and if it does, uh, I would add really punchy, collectible, vintage pieces, unique pieces, or pieces with provenance. All right. And thank you for uh, watching this video. Let Simon know what you think you should do. It's a beautiful collection. This is a collection that would you know, impress most people and, and most people uh, would never be able to achieve this. And, uh, and so there's something to be said for that for sure. So thanks again, Simon, and uh, be sure to like this video, subscribe, turn on your notification bells, share this with your watch loving friends, your non watch loving friends, and have a great day. Thanks for watching. See you next time.